Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello, and welcome to the very first Louisiana Spotlight, formerly known as Louisiana Public Square. I'm Drake LeBlanc, co-founder and creative director of Tele Louisiane. We are excited to premiere this brand new series, which features more in-depth documentary storytelling and the important panel discussions you've come to love. We're inaugurating this program with a deep dive into one of Louisiana's most unique communities and the existential threats it faces. The Pueno Shan Indian tribe is made up of 800 members, primarily of Chittimacha, Washa, and Chihuahua descent. Their ancestors thrived here centuries ago, living off the land long before the first Europeans ever arrived. The tribe lives at the bottom of the boot on one of the five-fingered bayous in Terrebonne and Lafourche parishes. The Terrebonne Basin, where Pueno Shan is located, is the fastest eroding basin in the United States. The relentless land loss now threatens their very way of life. Tonight, I'll talk with members of the Point Ocean tribe to discuss their culture and their fight to preserve it, their struggle for federal recognition, and what the future of the town and tribe looks like following Hurricane Ida's devastation five months ago. But first, let's take a closer look at who the Point Ocean are and their way of life down the bayou. Wanashan is one of the oldest inhabited communities in the state of Louisiana, continuously inhabited by my ancestors and we continue to live here. It's very important to our culture and our whole way of life. You just have a feeling whenever you're here, the heritage that's here, it's a great place to be. So this area is historically Chittimacha, Washa, and Chawasha. So when the first Europeans came to Louisiana, this was inhabited. Wanashan was a self-sustaining community. You could grow food to eat, you could catch food to eat, you made your houses from the materials that was here, the palmetta for the roofs, but your houses were on the ground, there wasn't a great risk of flooding. We had fresh water, we don't have fresh water now. People had big gardens. So everything you needed, you had available to you to be a self-sustaining community. My name is Patty Ferguson Bonney. I'm from the Pornish Indian tribe and I'm also the attorney, one of the attorneys for the tribe. Some of the things I work on are federal recognition. That's one of my main areas of work on behalf of the tribe, assisting in obtaining federal acknowledgement from the U.S. government. And when we are talking about land loss, being able to protect our cultural heritage, our language, assert our self-determination, all of that's impacted by federal recognition. I also work on environmental issues and cultural issues supporting the language, heritage, and culture of the tribe. My name is Christine Verde, and we're at Pornisham um, Live Oak Baptist Church. So these past few days, starting on Wednesday, we, we began our culture camp that normally begins in June, the end of June, or beginning of July. Culture camp is important because our children, we realized did not know about their culture. So this is our ninth annual uh, culture camp. We felt that it was time that we start bringing back culture to our community. Language. My heart is in the land of my family, or my family's land. So a cut is your heart. Traditional plants that we had stopped using, the dresses, the jewelry, just to show them how our people live. Sing, seize, set, lift. You know, see, there was all live oak trees. So it was uh, like a forest over here. 
What y'all think calls that? Oh, when they levied off the Mississippi River. Yeah, very good. Braylon, one issue is they levied off the Mississippi River. No more fresh water coming down. So our boat ride, um, most of our kids haven't been past the end of the road here, but that's where our ancestors lived. They were able to see our mounds and could really see that the mounds were on higher grounds, also more trees on the mounds because, because they've not been exposed yet to the salt water. We want to teach them that here, Lower Pornish is not where we began. We began past that. Look right here, you can see the oil companies cut that. I see it's all opening up. That was not a bayou or anything right there. It's land and they cut it. So sooner or later, this will be all water. What do you think? Yes. We are directly impacted by things that other people are deciding without our input. So we contribute least to the climate issues, but we're impacted the most because this basin, the Terrebonne Basin, is the fastest eroding basin in the United States. And it is that way for a reason, because people have made decisions, man-made decisions about who should be protected, when they should be protected. You know, maybe these people should just move. This land traditionally was just land, just big pieces of land. I mean, it was one piece of land and one bayou. So when the oil companies came in in the early 1900s, they dug these little panasas, but little waterways that were probably just wide enough to put a chalon or like a little boat to bring things. And so the land was never put back where it needed to be. So it was never closed up. So these little waterways became wider and wider and wider. So if you have all these little waterways that are kind of intersecting, then, then your land is in pieces, which makes it much easier to erode. Because all these little waterways, the water's coming through from the Gulf. And so you have these hurricanes that come each year and just pound and pound and land is lost every day. We don't want to be recognized and not have any land and not have this land because this is who we are. This land is a reflection of us, our ancestors, and that's why in the song it says, my heart is in the land of my people because this is who I am. And our ancestors have toiled this land, they've lived here, they're buried here. This is part of who we are. Why would we want recognition if we're not connected to the land? We have been seeking federal recognition since the mid-90s. To be federally recognized means that the government recognizes that you are an indigenous community um, and that you have a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States. And along with that, you have rights, certain rights to health care, education. Um, you also, if there's a storm, for example, which we're in Pornishan, uh, we would deal directly with the federal government with FEMA. Right now, everything goes through the parishes or the state. And basically, Pornishan is an afterthought. The Bayou parishes are bracing for impact as Hurricane Ida strengthens to a major storm. They expect to feel the first impacts from Ida in less than 24 hours.
I've enjoyed getting to know the Puerto Shan tribe members with my work with Tele Louisian over the past few years. As you can see, it's an unusual and beautiful place. Patty and Christine will be joining me later in the show, but first, we've asked the tribe's lead historian, Dr. Laura Kelly, to share more with us about the tribe's rich heritage. Dr. Kelly is a professor at Tulane University and is integral to the tribe's petition for federal recognition. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, if you can, tell me, how did you first meet the people of Pueno Shan? It was in January of 2005. Um, I remember it so well because I had actually been in New Mexico and Arizona in December of 2004. And as somebody who had a PhD in U.S. history, I was struck by my lack of knowledge about the indigenous peoples of North America. And I resolved right then and there, when I got back to Louisiana, I said, I'm going to learn more and I'm going to integrate it into my teaching and try to um, make up for that, that lack, you know, the one that I experienced, but not for the students at Tulane. I wasn't home but a couple of days and Patty Ferguson sent me an email and asked if I was interested in helping to do research for the tribe and research specifically for the federal recognition petition. So it's like the universe heard me, called out and I responded and that was, that was what, 17 years ago. Wow. So 17 years, I mean, 17 years you've been working with Patty and um, the people of Puerto Shan to help mm -hmm. them get federally recognized, is it normal for that process to take that long? Yes, and in fact, um, it would be great if it was only 17 years. The first step when you, um, in this whole process, is you have to send the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Office of Federal Acknowledgement a letter of intent, a letter that says, we are going to apply to be federally recognized, enter the petition process. The tribe sent that letter in 1996. You know, wow. stop and think about that for a moment. It was yeah. before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. In fact, that's a great you know juxtaposition because as historians, we normally look at 25 years as like the length of a generation. Mm -hmm. And so it's been that, it's been a generation. It's been before you were born. Right. Um, and here we are and the process is still ongoing. So putting that much time and energy into this process, what does it mean to be federally recognized? What are the benefits that, that come with that? Well, as Patty spoke about on the video that we watched right before, it puts the tribe in a nation to nation, government to government relationship with the federal government. And that opens up all kinds of benefits in terms of education, healthcare services, and in terms of storms and the environment, um, it means that the tribe would be able to deal directly to FEMA, directly to the federal, federal government, and work on helping their members. So there are a lot of different benefits, but I think it's also an important recognition about a tribe that's been here for a very long time um, and who inhabit this land and we should do what we can to, to recognize that. So essentially, you're trying to help tribal members prove mm -hmm. um, that they're of Native American descent, right? Yeah, it's kind of a really odd situation when you think about it, you know, prove you're an Indian, <laughs> you know, <laughs> prove who you are. Uh, we don't really ask that of almost of any other group that I can think of. And it's a complicated and it's an onerous process. So there are seven criteria and you have to meet all seven. You can't meet six and a half, you can't meet six and three quarters, you have to meet all seven. It's all or nothing. The part I work on is the historic part. You have to show descent from um, tribe or tribes. You have to show direct connections to people, to the progenitors, to the ancestors of Ponishan and follow it down through the time. Now, that's difficult, but then you stop and pause for a moment and think about what's being asked and the type of evidence that's being asked. So you're asking that we use basically Eurocentric type documents. You go to church records, marriage records, baptism. Now, what happens when you have to try to find evidence for people 
who didn't get married in your church or who didn't get baptized in your church or who weren't even considered and counted in other government documents. You're, you're asking them to prove they're Indian, but you're also asking them to prove it using these Eurocentric institutions. So what kind of documents do you look for? We have to use the voices of post commanders, the voices of Anglo-Americans, of Europeans, of colonials, and see what they have to say. And so, you know, right now we have some documents that are being played here. You, you get some that have this beautiful handwriting and they're easier to read. Others can have really bad bleed through. But again, going back to the first point, it's not even just enough to find mention in those documents about a tribe, Chittimacha. You have to find specific people. What I did and what my students have helped with and tribe, tribal members have helped with is that we looked at the Spanish archives. There are millions of documents bundled up in these things called legajos, and these legajos have 1,000, 1,500 documents in each legajo. So we went through them, and we went through them, and ultimately we ended up going through 50,000 documents. Wow. Yeah, and 50,000 documents, I'd say about 85% were in French, 10% were in Spanish, and about 5% were in English. And just reading through all of these, looking for clues and hints um, to what we could find. And we found stuff. It was, it was an effort that paid off. So I have a question mm -hmm. about um, the Terrebonne Basin, which is sometimes called the Cajun Bayou Country. Mm -hmm. The Pueno Shan people aren't Cajun, but Cajun speak French. The Pueno Shan people speak French. What's the difference? Well, again, I'm not a linguist, but I would say that your question is wrong. Um, and that is that the Cajuns, the Acadians, right, the Cajuns, they came much later. They came onto Chittimacha land. Mm -hmm. So the question is from, if you change your perspective, um, what is it like for the Cajuns to live in Chittimacha country? That's mm -hmm. the question I'd ask. And it's great in the sense of the way you phrased it, because I think that is the typical way to phrase it. Um, it's as if history started with the arrival of the Europeans. And we forget that this whole area was chock full of nations, chock full of tribes. It uh, didn't start, you know, 1782 with La Salle or 1699 with Arborville and Bienville. Um, it's much older, much older than that. And we should incorporate that into Louisiana's cultural heritage much more. I agree, definitely. Thank you so much for coming out today and, and sharing this information with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, I'll sit down with tribe members in our panel discussion to take a deeper look at the issues they are facing. But first, let's see how Hurricane Ida affected this small community and what the future looks like for Point O'Shan. The day usually starts around 3.30, 4 o'clock, head out on the water to start working right around daylight. Let's get it. If you didn't know this place before the storm, it was unrecognizable. You'll see more once the sun comes up. My name's Alex Billiot. We're in Pointe-Shan, Louisiana, and I fish crabs and buy crabs for a living. I've been fishing almost my whole life. I grew up doing it, watched all my relatives, you know, elders, they all have done it. They, um, they grew up doing it from trapping to, to, to fishing, shrimping. They, they've done it all. This area right here, they basically lived off the land, and they made a living living off the land. And growing up watching them do that kind of gave me the excitement of wanting to do it myself. And like I said, as a kid, if you see something like this, it gives you even more of a desire to want to do it. 
know, when, when you got gear coming up that looks like this, I mean, if you love the water, there's nothing else you'd want to do. We're basically offshore here. You have your northern shoreline, what's left of our coast. And then when you look to the south, there's absolutely nothing left. There used to be islands out there, closed in lakes. Just from what my dad used to tell me, the stories of how they used to have closed in lakes out there. And my generation comes along and it's all, all gone. It's very mind blowing. Just for instance, just after this one hurricane that we just got, Hurricane Ida, you look over the levee right here in the back and land that was there before the hurricane is completely wiped out and gone. And that's on the inside of the levee system. So just think how much land we're losing on the outside. You know, when you lose that amount on the inside, it's, it's very scary. We evacuated and stayed gone for a week, huh? September 1st we came back. Yeah. And we come back down and it took me three or four days before I come right down here because I didn't want to face I didn't want to face reality, I guess is another way of putting it. You know, heard stories. I didn't want to see it for myself. And then finally I was like, you know, I gotta go down there. That's Freddy's place. He's gone. That's the Alton. And with that house, he lost it. That's Henry and the knee right there. And that's old Rod right there. That's Rod right there. Oh, yeah, Rod, yo. All right. That's Anna Lou live there. Everybody, everybody. It's it's a ghost town now, man. I don't believe a ghost stayed out here now. Talking about the things that we did here, the memories we had. This is a sand lot. We played baseball. My right dad here. would pitch right here to us. Right here. Water in the yard, roosters in the trees. At the moment, I'm standing in front of my house where I grew up, childhood hood home, uh, being torn down. Can't be fixed, so we figured we'd just tear down. But it's and a very emotional day for us. The memories are there, but I still have the memories even though the house isn't there. You know, I still have them in my heart. And we all survived. I was lucky. I got to bring my mom and my dad to my camp in Mississippi, and we were taking turns taking care of them. But I know that it would break their heart if, if they were here to see what was going on. 
it's just devastating. Can you believe that only 14 houses in this whole community survived this hurricane? No one wants their childhood home to be destroyed like mine is right now. Hopefully Christina will build something and it'll have a new life. We're hoping that people don't leave. So instead of saying, well, let's build like it was built before, no, we're gonna research and see, let's build something, find something that's gonna withstand those 160, 65 mile an hour winds, which is what we have to look at now, because that's the only way we can say that we're gonna come back and, and, and be comfortable about not this happening all over again. Unfortunately, our people here don't have the resources. I would say that probably 5% of the people that live here in Pornish have insurance. Aunt Teresa! Wow. I love you. I love you too. So you just got this? I just got that today. Okay, good. So we can look at your house? Huh? Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. I don't know how it looks. I mean, it don't look good in there. No. Nothing look good in there. They don't want me in the house because too much allergy. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, it looked like a, uh, an explosion, huh? Wow. Whoa. Boy, it is. I don't think I'm going to go oh. further, but. Yeah, that's pungent. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they need to clean this out. Y'all don't have insurance, huh? Who? On the house. Uh-uh. No. He had insurance in it. But then after that, when he went to renew the insurance, because of the tree here and the tree in the back, they didn't want to insure the house because, oh. of, because of the trees. Where's our government? You know, it's not that we wait around for our government before we start, you know, we cleared the roads ourselves so that our, the people can come home. You, you see over here, we don't have the government coming. We have family that came from Mississippi to help us. You know, where is our government? Where is our parish president? Where is our governor? You know what? Pierre and them boys, they the one that cleared the road from the first house on down, the parish, they never even come down there one time. Who's helping y'all the most right now? Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay. Nobody. As our land erodes, and some people, it may feel it's already too late. But whenever a community breaks down and people start moving away because of hurricanes or, or the erosion, natural, just natural disasters down here, well then they shut down the schools, then they shut down the, the only store, and what else there is? For me and my family, I, I think there's no other way but up. You know, you don't stay kicked at the bottom. I mean, you just gotta do the best you can to save what you have or rebuild what you have and move on. But leaving, not an option. We are fortunate to have Puno Shan tribe members with us here in the LPB studio. Patty Ferguson Bonney is a tribe member and the tribe's lead lawyer. Christine Verdant is a tribal council member and a lifelong Puno Shan resident. And Alex Bilio, who we just heard from, is a tribe member and local fisherman. Yeah, I'm thanks. so glad that y'all could join me. Um, I have a question that I want to start with. Um, Christine, I'll start with you first. Okay. What does it mean to have grown up in Point O'Shan? So to grow up in Point O'Shan was great. I grew up on Terrebonne side. My parents bought property on, on Terrebonne side, but all my relatives were all on Lafourche. And so my mom would take us to visit them. There was a little bridge next to my house to cross the bayou. And we'd go into my grandma's. We'd go every day. And um, we'd play my grandma's yard. She we called it the farm. She raised her own cattle, pigs, had chickens, ducks. In her yard, way in the back where the cows were, we'd climb trees. There was a lot of land there, not at all like we just saw. 
My dad was a shrimper. He was an oysterman and then later on began shrimping. And so he'd dock his boat right and decide to buy you our house. And we go shrimping with him. My brothers learned how to shrimp and ran their own boat when they were teenagers. It was great growing up with my, my cousins. And I'm not just cousins with them, I'm friends, we're friends. So yeah, I would not trade that. I wish my kids could have experienced the way I grew up. Yeah. Um, have you always identified as um, an Indian? Yes, yes, always, since I was real little. Um, actually, I started school at the Indian school. When I started first grade, I uh, went to the Indian, Indian school. We weren't segregated yet. Well, we weren't integrated. We were still segregated. And I was in school probably about, I guess, maybe over a month. And that's when we integrated to the school. And, um, and that was because we were Indians. And so yeah. I've always knew and I've always been proud. My mama taught us to be proud of who, who we were and where we came from. And Patty, um, what, what is your connection to Point O'Shea? Yeah, so I didn't grow up in Pointe-a-Shan. My mom's from Pointe-a-Shan, and when she got married, she stayed around the Baton Rouge area. And when she was growing up, as Christine said, um, my mom's older than Christine, but she wasn't allowed to go to school. So she had to go all the way to the Rose Cutoff. She would cross the bayou in a, in a boat, and then someone would take them with a boat to Grambois, and then a bus would pick them up. And it was a very long journey, but they also faced a lot of discrimination and racism because they were Indians. And because of that, I think my parents wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to have education. But we spent a lot of time in Pointe-a-Shan when we were growing up, visiting my grandma, staying with my cousins, and I spent a lot of time in Pointe-a-Shan now. I know that I've had different opportunities than my cousins, and I knew that I was Indian because we were different than other people we were going to school with, but I only learned that we weren't fairly recognized when I started college. Mm. And I really wanted to work with the tribe. We had tribal leaders who were already working on this uh, to ensure and hopefully uh, win the fight for federal recognition. Right. Alex. What was it like growing up in Point of Shan? Wow. Man, it was exciting. Um, you know, different, but at the same time, you know, it, it got stressful. You know, whenever you see footage of, uh, of these hurricanes that come through, Hurricane Ida, when these people don't know what they're coming back to, you know, um, always having to, to leave for, for that, that's a stressful part of it. But we could have went out and paddled a pier dog and just hunt, jump in a boat and go fishing. Like Christine was saying, she went on the boat shrimping with her dad and, and it's, you know, we could go do that stuff and enjoy doing it. But at the same time, you know, whenever, it, it's really heart wrenching when you see videos like this and you hear of people not wanting to come back to this community. And, um, but man, there's no other place I'd want to live or grow up. Yeah. You know. And did you, um, Alex, did you, speak French at home growing up? Uh, but what was your primary language, you know, being in Point O'Shea? Well, I, I learned how, not necessarily how to speak the French. I learned how to communicate with my grandparents. My grandparents, they had the, the gathering house of the community where everyone would just come in there and, and have coffee and, and, and shoot, you know, shoot it off. And their main vocabulary was, was speaking French to one another. But we don't have that anymore. You know, it's, it's, it's dying off. So that wasn't only in your household, in your experience, but do you think other people in your generation, your age group, have also maybe not picked up French as much for, for different reasons? Let's look at it in this perspective. My real name is Alexon. Everybody knows me by Alex. I was named after my great-great-great-grandfather, which pronounced his name Alexon. His son, Edmond, was still French, pronounced Edmond. My grandpa was Forest, Forest, and my dad, Forest, is English. So as the generations went on, the French-speaking language, it just it went away, dissolved, slowly. 
And if there's one thing I, I regret not learning more of, it's the French speaking language. And Christine, what was it like for you growing up? Was it more French spoken at home or English? It was all French. Yeah. So I grew up and the whole community was French. So wherever I went, everyone spoke French. So, and I learned French, that's my first language. And so I didn't speak English until I went to, in, to the school, first grade. Um, I did speak it at the Indian school a little bit, but mostly French. But when we went to the Pornish school up the road, uh, which was the white community, it was English, and so teachers didn't understand French, and so we were punished for speaking e French. But when we went back home, when we went back down to Bayou de Pornichet, everybody still spoke French, so we kept our French. We did not speak English in my home until uh, the early 1980s, um, when my brother started dating his wife, and she didn't speak English, I mean French, we spoke English because of her, um, just for the respect. But still now, I speak only French to my brother. Very little English in my house and my with my parents is French. When I go to Pornichet, it's it's French. Still to this day. Still to this day, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. If you come to one of our meetings, more than half of it is going to be French. And I, I mean, the tribe is like what that video has shown us is that the tribe is not only slowly over time lost language but also land as well. And why do you think that is? Well, there are several reasons why we, we're losing land. Um, one, because of the early 1900s, like Patty said earlier, um, is when all field companies came in and dug these little waterways, they didn't come back and fill them. And so you have these waterways that have gotten bigger and bigger and then plus with the storms coming in um, we've had terrible storms you know Katrina, Rita, right. Ike, Gustav, um, Lily, Andrew, we had Betsy when I was real little um, those are huge storms that have come through Pornishan and um, each time have taken chunks of land yeah. away. Alex you had just mentioned in this video um, that during your lifetime you have seen the the changes in the land as well. How does that affect you personally? Big time. Um, there's, uh, people don't realize how much marshland we're losing on the inside the levee systems. These man-made levee systems, we're losing just as much land on the inside because the marsh, it, it is no longer has passage of water to keep it hard. No more sediment flowing through it. It gets soft. And it just, it washes away. After Ida, I come down and I seen how much of the, my marsh that I used to grow up duck hunting. It's just gone, you know. My eight-year-old son could go back there and paddle a piro, and I wouldn't have to worry about him getting lost because there's nowhere else for him to lose himself. But I rely on these, this marshland, these estuaries that we still have for work. It's my way of life. It's what I do for a living. Yeah. And once we lose this, I, I, I don't know what else there is. There's only what we can save now. And on that note, we're the front line. I believe we're the front line of that seafood industry that people don't know in New Orleans. Baton Rouge, as far as the blue crab capital of the world, Baltimore, Maryland. We supply, we are the supply chain for all these big cities all across this country. And once we lose the last little of this estuary that we have, what else is there? Yeah. You could go into towns where I could tell my kids, oh, there used to be a Shoney's right here. It's gone. You could rebuild that Shoney's. You could go and say, oh, there, there, this bowling alley just got wiped out by Hurricane Ida. You could rebuild that bowling alley because you still have the land. But once you lose this marsh, you can't rebuild. You can in a certain way, but it's all a memory of someone else telling it. How can you rebuild their memory if you haven't seen it? Yeah. Patty, what is, what is this land loss? Um, what, is it, what does it do for you emotionally? Well, there are a couple things and some things that Christine and Alex have mentioned that really 
stand out to me because when I look at it, at, you know, the big picture is that it indicates that people don't care about us. They don't care about our way of lives, that our rights aren't important, that our livelihood isn't important, that there hasn't been investment or accountability um, in our community. And that's, you know, that's tragic. And every, you know, people may not have realized initially what was happening when the oil cuts were coming in, but once you realize that, the answer shouldn't be, well, let's just abandon this area and give up. We should look at the traditional ecological knowledge um, of what should be done to protect the area, to restore the area, because there's multiple factors. It's the oil company canal cuts, but it's also the freshwater flow that's no longer coming into our community because they levied off the Mississippi River. And when they did that, at the time, they knew if nothing was done, that the communities outside of that levee system would face subsidence. So they knew and they put us at risk. So they made a decision to do that. And when they create these other systems, they put us more at risk and we're never consulted. We're not part of the conversation. So the people who contribute least are impacted the most, not just by you, you know, the Mississippi River or the oil co canal cuts, but also now we're compounded by sea level rise. So all of this is affecting us and it's just making everything um, happen much faster. So do you think um, the tribe becoming federally recognized can help um, overcome some of these obstacles that y'all have been facing? I do think that being fairly recognized will give us a stronger voice. It will first help us in responding to disasters uh, because we would have a direct interaction with emergency services and able to respond. But with restoring the land, we can't apply directly for grants. We have to go through other government organizations or other entities to apply for grants for restoration. We um, have knowledge that isn't respected that we could try to get people to um, recognize and uh, take those traditional knowledge holders and use that knowledge to do whatever restoration we can. We have threatened sites and um, sacred sites and burial mounds that are threatened because they're outside of this levee system that has been created. I think that there's a lot that could change and some of our fishing areas and village areas where people are living now, is right now there is a court case in the Federal District Court of New Orleans where the judge said, I can't decide this case until the federal government decides whether or not you're fairly recognized. And as a result of that, there's been a lot of exploitation. That's just been since the mid nineties. But over the years, there's been a lot of exploitation and that pause with us not being recognized results in more exploitation of our natural resources. Yeah. So after the hurricane, it, it seems like there wasn't much of a, a response from government and other entities that could help. Has anything changed? Has it, anyone come to help y'all as of today or recently? No. No. I mean, we've had our stuff picked up. Um, but as far as like to help us, or to help with rebuilding. It took a long time for FEMA to come down there. I don't know how many well, weeks. Well, I think the thing to recognize that after Ida, for at least a month, there wasn't water or right. electricity in Pornishan. And, and there wasn't gas, mm -hmm. there wasn't any gas. And that took a while to restore. And there weren't communications. And there weren't people, there were individuals who came in to help people in the community and there are people in the community helping people in the community, mm -hmm. but it wasn't as if tribal members were relying on the government to help them clean up. And uh, even yesterday, Christine's house, her family's house, um, that w the, the debris picked up the house. Mm -hmm. So how many months out from the storm are we? Four that the debris picked up the house. And some people, you know, we have to look at this in phases. One is response, we want people to be safe. Um, and that was 
you know, it, it, there was not a coordinated effort to work with the tribe to ensure that people were were safe. So that was tribal members helping tribal members and other uh, entities that were assisting in the community. But then looking forward, how do we have people rebuild resiliently so they can stay in the community when people don't have the resources? And there aren't going to be enough resources with whatever FEMA gives to people for, for them to rebuild. And I think the important thing is that right now people may be thinking, well, people should just leave. If they don't have the resources to rebuild, they should just leave. But the important thing to think about is that people have been put in this situation through no fault of their own. They didn't make the decision to levy off the Mississippi, to cut up all the oil and gas, to bring the water in. Homes 50 years ago could be on the ground, right? Homes even 20 years ago could be, 25 years ago could be on the ground. And so there hasn't been an investment in the community for people to harden their homes to be able to adapt to the changing environment. And I think that's very important to recognize that we're dealing with people who have been thrust into a situation that they have no part in making. And that's the last thing on people's minds whenever they come home. You've seen the elders, they come home and they have nothing left. I mean, I go down there as a generation or two even younger than these people, and we took it amongst ourselves to help them out to cut trees off the roads, to cut trees off of people's homes. You know, um, that's just the way we are. We, we go down there and we see something needs done and needs help, we, we help them out. But a lot of them, like in the video, my aunt was asked if she had any kind of insurance. There's no way mm -hmm. these people can afford insurance down there. I mean, it's, it's just out the roof. So a lot of people need to rely on that, that government entity to come in and help them out, you know. But when they first got down there, I can guarantee that was the last thing on their mind was, you know, just when are they going to come? They wanted to figure out what they still had left. That's the biggest, that's the biggest thing is the loss. Like, but it's so, so would federal recognition have prevented any of this loss, what would that have changed if y'all would have had it before this, these major hurricanes hit? I think like Patty, the response would have been quicker. But it also could have helped us secure funding to harden the homes. So tribal members have elevated their homes, but as um, Christine was mentioning, she grew up on the Terrebonne side. Across the bayou is the Lafouche side, and all of those homes are on family property. So when there was this road home program in Louisiana after Katrina and Rita, the homes, homeowners, because they are homeowners, they were not provided the same amount of resources as other people because they were considered renters because they live on family property. So they had to make a decision. Do I fix my home on the ground or do I elevate my home? But it may, be, may not be hardened as much as it should be because once I go in, up into the air, what does that mean? That means my house is gonna take more wind when that wind's coming through and I need to have a strong roof, I need to have strong walls, it needs to be strapped down. And people didn't have the resources to do everything to hearten their homes. And you're, hard, you're raising a home that may have been built 50 years ago and that was okay, right? Because when my, grandma, when my um, mom was growing up, they lived in a Palmetto house. That house was on the ground, right? That were the, those were the circumstances in which you could live. You can't, you can't do that now. You can't have your house on the ground yeah. and you can't live in a Palmetto house. So do you think the people of Point O'Shan can survive the loss of the land that they're currently facing? To me, if you can pipeline from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to Canada, why can't you bring in sediment, pipe in sediment from the Chafalaya Basin in Mississippi into our areas. When I was growing up, I'd go to Last Island, Timberlake Island. We would ride four wheelers uh, on there and walk for miles. That's and that was that's not even there anymore. It's not there anymore. There are no landmarks. When I'd go out there with my dad, 
I know, okay, well, we're going to turn here because I see such and such. Or I'm going to turn here. You know, I know where dad's going. Now to do that, I cannot. There are no, no marks. Yeah. But not only that, when you look at some of Lafouche, they seem to be protecting their land more than Terrebonne. Mm -hmm. Restoring. Why? Why do you think that is? All port. Well, there's a big port there. So money. Protecting money. They're trying money. to protect their investment. Yeah. There's more money that flows down there. You know, um, they're, they're, they're protecting what brings in the revenue. Yeah. Terrebonne Paris doesn't bring in that much revenue with the oil. We do it in a different source with the seafood. But Lafouche borders the Terrebonne Basin. And you look on the map, Lafouche is still looking good marshland wise. Mm -hmm. But the Terrebonne Basin from Ponachan, Montague, Dulac, Chauvin, it's all part of the Terrebonne Basin. You know, we're concentrating on Ponachan right now, but it's, if you look at it as a whole, whole coast. the whole coast as a whole, and it's something that we're pushing for as a tribe, but I think it's a, a step that everyone along the coast has to take into consideration yeah. because we can't be the only voices. There has to be more to step up and say, look, I want to save this. I want to save my livelihood. I want to save, you know, I want my kids to be able to do what I'm doing. And at the rate we're gone, my eight-year-old son won't see what I've seen. Mm -hmm. I don't see what my dad's seen. Mm -hmm. right. You know, there's memories. Do you feel like the efforts are equal from surrounding communities, the neighboring communities? Do you feel like they're putting as much into it as far as speaking out about um, the land loss and, you know, the changes that they're facing? I really, I don't hear a whole lot besides what's coming from our politicians about the levee system. Levee system's all fine and dandy if a hurricane comes and that levee could withstand the strength of a hurricane, but you don't hear them talking about the marshland on the outside of it. They're investing millions and millions of dollars on these levee systems that to me, the only thing they're good for is a hurricane. But that's, that's the only thing you hear about. The restoration, dredging, there's so much technology out there. You don't have to go all the way to the Mississippi River. You don't have to go to the Chafalai River. You can go right down the Gulf and set up some suction dredging and just pump sand or sediment back into the marshland just to build it back up. You don't have that. Yeah. Patty, I want to ask you, do you feel like Hurricane Ida affected the timeline for getting federally recognized, getting Point O'Shea federally recognized? So this year was our year to focus on our petition, so it's definitely set us back, but we just met last week and we're moving forward to, because we know how important this is to everything, to the, you know, to the whole survival of the community. Um, the other thing that I just want to mention is last week at the tribal meeting, the tribe passed a resolution to oppose the development of RV camps and campers coming into the community because right now people's livelihoods are being threatened because they lost their home for Ida. There's not sufficient support to rebuild. So people may be selling their land, turning them into camps. And we feel like as a tribe, we should be consulted whenever these decisions are made because they threaten the health, safety, and welfare of our community. And to go to your question, are other people complaining about or advocating for restoration of the Terrebonne Basin? Uh, there's a lot of people who look at this area and they have great fishing and um, great resources, and so they want to have sports fishing camps. They want to go sports fishing. And we want to make a statement that we don't want Pornishan to be a sports fisherman's paradise. And there's been investment from the government for that to happen. And because we're a residential community and we want to continue our way of life and our culture and have our community and have that support. And I just think that goes to your question and it's important to note that, that we're going to push back on that. There's already been a lot of that. There's been land that was turned over in the past that is questionable. Um, but we want to maintain a residential community. Um, and we think we're going to have a stronger voice if we get fairly recognized. So we have to move forward 
to work on federal recognition? Well, um, I definitely hope and know that y'all will get that federal recognition and um, it's really inspiring to see everything that y'all are putting, pouring into your communities, staying there and, you know, just speaking out about the things that should change. So thank y'all so much for coming out today and sharing what y'all have. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks for it, having us. For our final segment of the show, I'll be speaking with the director and producer of Louisiana Spotlight, Ben Johnson. We'll find out about his experience filming this project and what's next for LPB's programming about Pono Shen. So Ben, what brought you down to Pono Shen? Uh, originally, it was the closing of their elementary school. So as you've seen that, you know, a lot of the facilities in Pono Shen had closed pre-storm um, and one of the big things that the community did an outcry about was the closing of their elementary school in April. And that's what originally brought me down there to start filming that culture camp. Um, and it was because of some local journalists, this a journalist named Kezia who brought me down there, uh, some of her stories on the school closing. And that was it. Yeah. So have you seen any of the themes that were going on as far as help from um, the government with Punishan, things that you were noticing with the, the closing of the school or attempting to close the school, have you seen any of that? It's definitely a theme. This show is gonna develop further into a documentary about Punishan tribe, and so we're gonna dive a little bit more into the themes that pop up that goes over their, their history. Yeah, when can we expect to see that? The documentary we're hoping to have out on the anniversary of Ida, and we're also gonna be doing this Louisiana Spotlight Quarterly, so the next one will be in April, and it'll be kind of the same, more documentary-based exposés of culture and community in Louisiana. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, I'm sure me and everyone else watching looks forward to seeing much more about um, the people of Puno and the, the work that you're gonna put out about them. So, Thank you. Well, we've run out of time for our discussion tonight. We want to thank Ms. Ferguson Bonnie, Ms. Verdan, Mr. Bilio, and Dr. Kelly for sharing their knowledge and stories of Puno Shan. We encourage you to comment on tonight's show by visiting lpb.org slash Louisiana Spotlight and clicking on the Join the Conversation link. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching and good night. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.